there were a few questions about like, hey, you got all this great data. Where do you get it from? I know you get some from NAR, but Housing Wire actually, you'll have a product where agents can get this data in real time. Can you talk a little bit about that? The Housing Wire tracker incorporates the bond market is basically the the bond market data that you, anybody who tracks the ten year yield or has a device that tracks the ten year anybody can do that. But I incorporate the bond market, the mortgage back secure, the mortgage back um, mortgage purchase application data that you saw the the red uh, ch- red line charts, and then Altos Research is weekly data. Nobody has that. It goes up to the very last day on Friday for the previous week. So what I do is I incorporate the weekly data, the bond market data, the purchase application data, then all the economic reports that are coming out for the next week. And we try to format where we think housing is going because purchase application data from the Mortgage Banking Association, it looks out 30 to 90 days. You don't just apply for a loan and then buy a house two days later. It doesn't work that way. But historically, since the mid 1990s, if you track forward looking housing data, it tells you what's happened. So everyone's shocked. Like people are like, what's going on with home prices? Why isn't it crashing? Like, dude, market changed November 9th. Uh, we have a top 10 national podcast, and you can see my humor when I talk about this that people don't read, right? I always say reading is a good thing. And if anybody read the weekly data, like I've done, I've tracked this, um, it worked. It's always worked. And this is the fourth time I would say in the last 10 years that forward-looking housing data changed. We saw this in uh, 2014, 2015, 2018, and 19. In 2020, it happened so fast that it happened at the uh, same year. And this is the fourth time where the data changed, the forward-looking data changed, and then all of a sudden, now it hits the data lines, you know, three or four months later, bam, there it is. Now, Altos Research, which is part of Housing Wire, they have a whole different uh, sphere of, of uh, inventory pending home sales, but they're very key on weekly data tied to your zip code. You know, Mike Simonson on Twitter will do a YouTube talking about the national data, but he could even specialize it to any zip code out there, which is very beneficial to the real estate agents that have it. My job is to look at the economic data forward looking to try to connect the dots for housing. And it worked again, just like it worked in 2020, 2018, 19, back then. Purchase application data from the MBA, the 10-year yield is uh, uh, the, the, the the bond market. Um, Autos Research gives us the weekly new listings data. And then I just incorporate it with all the economic data that we have, what's coming up, what reports are coming in as the Fed meeting, everything. Try to make it simple as possible to give people a forward-looking view. That's amazing. All right, I'm going I'm to hit you with a two-pack. One is, on this slide, there's a question. So does this mean that the cost of ownership is 53% higher than the cost of renting? Is that, is that how someone should read this slide? That's just the percentage difference between price, the price, the FHFA price index the, versus the equivalence of rent, right? So rents never deflate, really. If you look at the history of rent inflation going back to World War II, we don't have these really big declines in rent because most people are always working. But the price index went up so much so fast. We had 42% price increases from 2020 on. So rent inflation picked up much noticeably too in 2020. That was another thing. To, it was hard to convince people that rent inflation was about to take off. Um, but that gap is noticeable. What people thought would occur was that when home sales were crashing last year, pricing would uh, get down and they would, people try to connect the dots here by these are going to merge together. This is not necessarily the case until you get inventory to skyrocket and, and, and sales to stay low for a very long time. So you can see the difference back then during the housing bubble years, when housing was crashing, demand was crashing, inventory was skyrocketing. Rents now have picked up a lot uh, recently. Uh, in the last few years, the growth rate of rent is cooling down. That's actually going to be good for mortgage rates going out the next uh, two or three years. We have near a one million apartments, but pricing now, you know, home pe- people buy a home and they stay there for a long time. So it's irrelevant that this index is that high until you see supply increase, demand crash, rates stay higher for a longer time because this gap can get a lot higher uh, than what we've seen right now. Rent inflation will cool down, but that uptrend that we've seen uh, in rent inflation will stick. It's really rare to get uh, rental uh, uh, deflation decline, but that gap is holding now, right? It's not crashing like we saw uh, previously. And now that you have all the inventory data and the demand data, you could see why 
it's really hard for prices to crash when it's hard. It's it's crazy for me to say this, but this is this is I have to convince people this when total inventory is near all time lows and demand is stable. If demand was crashing still and supply increases, then the people have to sell their homes at a lower price to move product. People are staying in their homes longer and longer. So uh, this chart has been used. I remember going up to 2020, people would say, look, there's such a big gap between the home price index and the equivalence rents. It has to go back down to 2012 levels. No, it doesn't. <laughs> That's not how it works. It looks like the housing bubble was from 2012 to 2019. Never was the case. Here, we had a massive increase in prices in a very short amount of time, but rent inflation took off so much as well. So there's a bunch of questions about consumer debt. You know, we hear the headline like, oh, consumers have all this credit card debt. They're, you know, first payment defaults on auto, on credit cards, all those things. What are your thoughts on that? Consumers' debt, household debt payments are at all-time lows. You always have delinquencies on car payments and auto loans. They're all still at all-time lows. They don't show you the percentages. They'll take you the nominal. Credit card growth rising went with the longest economic and job expansion ever recorded in history. When credit card growth deteriorates, that's when you get a recession. So many bearish American citizens, and this is my thing, from 2010 to 2019 kept on saying credit card growth is rising. Delinquencies were higher in the previous expansion. And we had the longest economic and job expansion in history. So they use the credit deterioration except we don't see it in the housing data. Why? Because homeowners, consumer liability debt costs to their wages are near all-time lows. Why? Because the majority of people that have debt in this country are homeowners. The majority of the highest income, highest education, falls, highest net worth are homeowners. So they're saying, but the renters who got a subprime car loan is defaulting. They have a higher percentage default in the previous expansion. They don't show you that. Right. So scare tactic is always uh, when a job loss recession happens, we do have credit models to track housing during this entire time. 30 day delinquencies, 60 day delinquencies, 90 day delinquencies in housing and new listings data are at all time lows. But nominal credit card debt is growing. Wonderful. We have one hundred and sixty seven trillion dollars in financial assets. We have about 18 trillion dollars of consumer debt. There's going to be stress in the data, but housing data is different than auto loan data, right? There's a huge difference. We had more stress in the previous expansion, actually, in percentage terms. Uh, uh, we can see the credit stress come first, but you're going to need to see 30, 60, 90 day lates rise, not at all time lows. Job loss recession could lead to something like that. Not what we see here. Credit card growth deteriorating bad for the economy. Right, uh, credit card growth growing still means that people are spending. That's how we've had these long, very economic expansions. Uh, so there, there comes a point to where there's certain households that'll get hit. Renter financial profiles without a high school education has been the deterioration of credit debt. We've seen it for ten years. We'll focus on that profile when it happens, but that's for the renter side. On the household homeowner side, different case. Mortgage payment as a percentage of disposable incomes are near all time lows. And that payment is not growing in terms of the debt costs. Why? Fixed debt costs, rising wages. Give us the download. Like when are when is that spread going to close on rates? When are rates coming down? And what's the housing market going to do between now and the end of the year? So the housing market, I would I would say it's not having like a V-shaped recovery. It's just stabilizing. But if the jobs data gets weaker and weaker, then the 10 year yield should flow. Now, the question is, when does the spread, the Federal Reserve, if they wanted to, says one sentence to the public, the spreads would get better on themselves. Okay. They are purposely making sure that the housing market is in check because they're afraid of housing going off again. Uh, so follow the jobs data, follow the 10 year yield data. I've given you a model of data to track housing data. It's in Housing Wire, it's a tracker. Wall Street follows it, the Fed follows it. It's here to give you the freshest look. So, if bond yields fall, mortgage rates fall, that is a net benefit for housing. We saw that happen from November now, except right now we're just stabilizing the data. To get to that next stage, we need mortgage rates to fall. And usually that's going to take the labor market to get weaker. And then eventually the Fed cries uncle and says, okay, we're, we're, we've already got our job loss recession. We want to make sure that it doesn't get worse. In that environment, 
with sales as low as they are right now, that's a benefit for housing, right? If rates were higher and the economy was booming, right? We're still dealing with that. But here, different story. Don't get caught into the 2002 to 2008 credit models, right? Wall Street has been wrong for this for a long time. Crash people have been wrong. There's pure raw data to show you when things are breaking apart. We don't see it yet. We have not seen it yet. We saw an affordability crisis. Prices and rates went up so much so fast it crashed sales, but you can see it now. You have all the data that the market just stabilized and it makes sense what's happening with pricing. 